Okay, last section then, and you can go home to your Valentine's date. Uh, so this one, this section is going to be about the top two levels of the integrated product development. So concurrent engineering, we were talking about the interface between the product and production, but now we're going to look at the uh, interface between the product and the market. So one of the case studies, this is uh, a project I worked on in my master's project, um, and it was to produce what well, I was introduced by Clive Stevens, the uh, managing director of Euronova, and asked to produce quick-release security screws for small paintings. Um, now, we know if we've done anything about product de um, definition in the past that that's, a, that's not a very good brief. For a start, it says um, screws, which implies a solution, and you shouldn't be thinking that. Um, and basically, we had to broaden the scope. The first thing I had to do was broaden the scope to look at what the market was and what the real problems were. So doing some background research into the area, um, I looked at how many thefts were uh, undertaken in the United Kingdom, how many paintings were stolen or bits of artwork and so on. Um, and one of the main uh, important shifts or statistics was crime had migrated from nighttime fraud to snatches during opening hours, which means thieves, instead of planning burglaries and and being a bit more sophisticated, thinking, how are we going to break into this gallery? How are we going to steal and get away with this artwork? They were just going in during daytime with big trench coats on, taking small paintings, putting them underneath their jackets and walking out. And this change in user behavior or, or uh, thieves' behavior, in a sense, uh, basically made a, a market opportunity for us. So we were designing a new security system based around this. Now, one of the first things I did, uh, I'm not going to go through this entire case. Um, I was working essentially as a consultant, having to uh, provide my own, for my own needs, I needed to produce a, a good product, hopefully something that may be patentable and so on. I was also providing for the needs of my primary customer, which was Euronova. These were the people who were going to be selling this product. I also had to provide for their customer, the secondary customer, which was the art galleries. So Euronova had to produce this product and then sell it to the art galleries who would buy it. And I also had to take into account the considerations of the tertiary customer, which was the art observers. So the art galleries would only buy this product if uh, it was interesting for the art observers. It didn't detract from their experience of looking at paintings. So being behind a glass case wouldn't really be a good solution. The art galleries would only buy it off Euronova if it was low cost, um, easy to install, easy to maintain and so on. Um, and Euronova would only buy it off me if it was a good product with decent profit margins. And then of course I had to work within some constraints and. Uh, actively exclude the needs of the art thief, uh, the anti-customer. Um, and this was one of the products, uh, prototypes I came up with, which was a, a mechanical lock that fits discreetly behind uh, the frames of each of the paintings. Um, and the nice thing about it was you could customize the keys. So uh, Euronova had the scope to uh, provide a service to customize the keys depending on the gallery. So you could have one key that worked for all the paintings on a particular floor or for a particular exhibition and so on. And the nice thing was it was quick releasing. So if there's a fire or an emergency in the building, they can go around and just go da da da, pull all the paintings off and get them out of there. So at the same time, it had to be very secure, but also quick releasing. So that was essentially the, the project. But the, the important thing to note there was this uh, customer pyramid and think about how many of the different customers in a chain you may have to provide for or cater for the needs of. Sometimes it's a little bit more uh, complex. In my case, it was quite linear as a pyramid. In other instances, there are stakeholders coming in off the main chain of value. So you may have to consider uh, suppliers 
uh, marketers and so on. Here's a, a particular map of the stakeholder relations for this coffee vending machine. Um, and as you can see, they've mapped here things such as money flow, service, communication, products and materials. And your products and services may be a lot more complex. There are um, these gaps here um, have two brackets which are screwed into the back of the frame of the painting. And the paintings are held from their, their original hooks. So basically it can be retrofit onto the current um, painting systems. So just to give you a quick diagram. There's the painting. It's usually secured and hung from these two points here. Um, and my system just fit along the bottom here. And in those gaps, there were two hooks which were secured to the painting which fit into those gaps at the back. The key enters from underneath to release it. You, you do need the key. So the idea was uh, the key was integrated into the security guards' badges and things. So they just go along. But it's not find, find a hole, rotate. It's just a swipe card. Um, um, and it's just one point. Uh, then these just lift off straight away. And the nice thing is it, it still holds in place when you unlock it so it doesn't just drop. Um, it was quite a reasonably simple design, but it, it, it worked for all, all of the considerations quite well. It didn't, uh, we produced it to batch manufacture and it didn't go further um, because I hadn't got the, the production systems right. I tried to produce it all for as, as low cost as possible, but uh, basically when I left the project, uh, nobody could keep pushing it on, on any further. It had something like uh, six different components most of them just simple aluminium extrusions, um, which on the face of it um, would produce a decent profit margin. But what I didn't take into account was all the, the metal cleaning. So when you extrude a part um, and then part it off, so you make a long extrusion and you cut the parts into segments, you have to clean off a lot of the burrs um, and the fragments that come off. Otherwise, it looks a mess. And I hadn't really taken into consideration how, how difficult this process can be and how costly it can be. Uh, the main body was um, exactly the same problem. It was done on a milling machine, five axis milling machine, um, and the deburring was really the killer. Um, and I just didn't have enough time to take it to the next phase. So it was essentially a bit of a flop at the production level. Um, that's where it didn't go forward. But it had the market there, the product was good and it was interesting just didn't hit the production values. As I say, it may be uh, more complex and you may want to map on services, products, materials, communication and money flow. Uh, these can all add value to your value system. And we can also just map out more simply the supply chain. So if we consider the case that I gave in the, uh, in the second lecture, uh, for these types of parts. We'll have the packaging firm producing the insert. They also produce the cap and they then insert the plastic insert into the cap. But they have to outsource uh, the production of this plastic cap to an injection molding firm perhaps. They then is assemble the whole system. They then pass this on to the uh, filling and production line where the bottle is filled, the cap is then capped onto the bottle. It's then sold onto the retail outlet like Netto or whoever it may be, and then onto the consumer. Um, so it was reasonably linear, but there were some offshoots as well in terms of the supply and production. And then we also have to consider other stakeholders such as labeling, how we're gonna do the tamper proofing, whether that's an add-on feature or whether it's integrated into the design. Um, and maybe somebody else is doing, providing the quality control. Here's a paper I wrote with uh, um, some colleagues uh, looking at stakeholder activities. 
Now, this is for, uh, this is for an IKEA case or furniture uh, production and distribution company. And this has got the activity cycle for the customer um, and the company, so the producing company. And essentially what we mapped out was uh, pre, during and post use of the customer and pre, during and post use of the, the supplier, IKEA. Um, and uh, you should have the print off of this. Um, but you'll have each of the activities which we mapped onto the process. This is for a conventional packaging supplier, uh, sorry, furniture supplier. What IKEA did differently was remove a couple of the uh, activities from the, um, um, from the furniture supplier and place them onto the activity cycle of the customer. So this was a way of visualizing and understanding how the business can be reconfigured in terms of the activities provided. You can take that further. You may remember this uh, diagram from the previous lecture about the product life cycle and then the customer's activity cycle. Well, another way to represent this, a really nice way, again, pre, during, and post use, looking at the customer, then at some point along each of these use points, uh, along each of these activities, they will interact with another um, provider. So at the point of sales, they may interact with your company, in which case they interact with one of the activities of your company. So you can look at it from a customer-focused perspective and then map on uh, the activity cycles of all of the other um, stakeholders and think which activities they interact with the customer's activities. So it may look something like this. And each of these circles represents an activity cycle. So we have an exercise for you now, which is to consider uh, sun cream or sun lotion and to think about the supply chain of sun lotion and the activity cycles of each of the stakeholders. I'd like you to map it out and try and understand what the situation is with sun lotion and whether you can reconfigure it to a better solution, whether any of the stakeholders' activities or the customers' activities provide kind of um, an extra opportunity to add value and to reconfigure the business model. So try, use one of these techniques, either this one or this one, to map out um, the situation for sun cream and then come up with a new proposed solution for how to improve it. So in your groups you have, I'll give you 10 minutes to do this. Okay, so hopefully you've all got some kind of rough sketch on what you think the product life cycle and the customer activity cycles are now. Um, what would you say the first interaction in any sense the customer has with the product of sun cream or sun lotion. Go ahead. I'm guessing it's the bottle. It's the bottle. Yeah, I'm looking at the bottle. Okay, but before they've seen the bottle, do they have to do anything before that with regards to sun lotion, sun cream? Well, I was going to say advertising, supposedly. Advertising, okay. That's a good point. But in, in terms of the, the customer's activity, I think there's something that goes on before that. Yeah. Okay, so he could... <laughs> I, th I think it's absolutely right. They, they have to realise that they need it. They, you can either be triggered to a certain sun lotion on, on TV and an advert, and you may have to decide before you go out to the shop that you may be needing this product in the future. So you have to realise you need it. Um, then you may go to the shop and you may see the bottle and the product. Um, so there's a stages of uh, exposure to the product beforehand. Um, so once you've decided you may need to buy this product, you go to the shop, you see the bottle, the next stage would be to purchase it. Sorry? Okay, so... Uh, there's a decision process there on product differentiation, which is the most uh, suitable uh, 
uh, product for your needs. Then there's another activity after that. We purchase. And then what's the next activity the customer goes through? Transportation. Transport it home. Then what? Storage. Storage. And then? Out the back. Usage. Use. But maybe, I, I would argue that there's something before use there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and not only that, but deciding that you need it to transport it to the beach. So you, you have to decide on that morning, I'm going to need this sun cream, I'm going to put it in my bag, and then you take it out to the beach, and so on. And then there's application, and then there's storage again afterwards, and then there's disposal, and so on. So there's so many activities. And the important thing to note is any one of these activities is a value opportunity for businesses. If you just take transportation, you, you could provide a, um, a solution where you uh, provide uh, sun cream or sun lotion to every person's house, depending on when you think the sell-by dates of their last uh, supply was. So it could be related to the transportation side. It might not be very feasible. Um, but at any point of these uh, user activities, you can potentially make some value from it for your business. So does anyone get to a point where they try to reconfigure this model uh, based on these activities to produce a better model of sun cream or sun lotion? Go ahead. Yeah. I'll say uh, we'll just come to one more and I'll come back to that um, I've written down that you could uh, just make one gel that you have to mix up with uh, some kind of normal cream yeah. so you did, didn't have to uh, in the shop figure out which uh, factor you needed that's a great suggestion yeah they're yeah, both really good suggestions for ways you can reconfigure this uh, product life cycle and the customer activity chain. So the, the guy at the back there was suggesting instead of having to premeditatedly think, I'm going to need cream because in a, few, in a few days time it might be sunny and then I need to take it with me to the beach, maybe you can just have dispensers at the beach. Um, so you can, you can get your sun cream on need rather than having to do it several activities before. So it wipes out some of the activities um, and produces it when the person needs it. And this gentleman here was suggesting that um, you can reconfigure the way the product is produced. So you have a generic lotion and then varying amounts of the sun protection factor that you put in. Um, and that could be done incorporated at the point of use. So you could perhaps vary the amount of sun protection factor you need, or it can be done at a later stage of the production cycle of the traditional model. So I think the solution we came up with when we were uh, thinking about this and trying to redesign it um, was really in line with the, what the guy at the back said. Uh, purchase of sun lotion is always premeditated or preempted. Uh, responsible people still end up getting sunburn uh, just because they get caught out. They have sun cream in their house, but perhaps they're out too long, perhaps, especially in northern countries, Denmark and Britain, for example, you don't expect it to be sunny, some days it is, uh, and then you end up getting burnt because of it. Um, and there is a real need to have the sun cream at places like national parks, beaches, and places where you really need it, rather than it being stored at home or in supermarkets where you don't really need it and you have to preempt it. So the idea we came up with was just very simple sachets of uh, sun cream. Uh, this is the product we designed. But more importantly for this was its routes of transportation. We knew if we wanted to go to remote areas like beaches, national parks, and places where people need these creams, the tricky bit would be how to get them there, how to get the products there. 
Um, so we took a meeting with the National Trust in the UK and um, tried to get these tagged on to National Trust supply lines. So National Trust have various shops at various points around the country at these national parks. If we can get this product on the National Trust shopping list, they will do the distribution for us. The other people we talked to were ice cream vendors. So perhaps we can tag this along to the ice cream uh, supply chain so that when uh, vans are supplied with ice cream, they're also supplied with this product. And then they're at the ice cream vans at the various um, locations, beaches and so on for them to be sold. So there were opportunities at very different uh, positions along the product life cycle and the customer activity cycle, which we could propose some quite different solutions with different values for. So I would suggest that you think about doing this for your own projects. Maybe you're not uh, taking advantage of the, all the value that's in your system at the moment. Think about your product life cycles and your customer activity and stakeholder activity cycles. Any questions on that? Uh, before I move on. Okay, I'm just going to run through a last few slides now on the rest of integrated product development. And according to some authors, there are a fourth dimension to integrated product development, and that is the business aspects of it. I'm just going to uh, run through quickly a few strategies where you can take into account the business side of IPD. So first of all, you can try fit your project within a portfolio of products within your business. You can do some technology road mapping, you can do some product platforms and market segmentation. So your project portfolios, businesses, when you're trying to forecast about the product ranges you may produce, you have to think in terms of how difficult the product is to develop, uh, sorry, probability of technical success and how much reward is likely. Now obviously we want as many in this quadrant as possible um, but we also need a nice spread of quite simple uh, products which we can guarantee success of and also uh, more difficult development projects so we can ensure we're innovating and moving in the right direction. And this is a bubble diagram of portfolio management. Technology road mapping is another way to do this. So you start to think, if you break down your product, and this is from Ulrich and Eppinger, they've got some very good chapters on this business aspect side to IPD. This is uh, for the Xerox Lakes um, photocopier project. And it basically lines out how the technology is developing on the time axis and the different platforms uh, developed. So... At a certain point, uh, they decided to move from the Hadaka uh, project or platform, which has se several variants, and realized enough technology has now changed and developed to um, make it feasible to produce a completely new platform. So that's when they launched the Lakes project. Then they had the Lakes extension project, and then they have to now decide what technology has to come into situation for it to um, kind of be feasible to produce a new platform altogether. Uh, does anybody just have interest, who knows what a platform is before I move on? Would you like to give me a description of what a platform is? Um, it's, it's something that you, when you use a platform, you can make um, many variants, variants of a product relatively cheap and relatively easy because you only have to change like one or two parts and they all fit on that platform. Yeah, perfect. Um, so it's about large change uh, to a new platform and then you can make very small changes to produce a large number of product variants. So it essentially means you can produce a, a well, cover a wide market segment based on very small product change. That's the whole strategy. And then people have, or companies have, these strategies for platform development. They may say, based on one platform, we're going to have several product variants which will cover a certain market sector until we get to the, 
the next change in technology and produce the new platform. And you can also incorporate this with market segmentation. And this is the thing I really think you should do. Is try and think of, for your products, a couple of performance parameters that are very important and say how your products or your platforms relate to the market area. So on this one, it's saying what the market segment is, whether it's departmental um, photocopiers, work group or personal photocopiers, and then the years of purchase. And Xerox used this to say, which market segment are we really focusing on? The Lakes project looked at departmental level. And departmental level, I presume they define as several sheets per, per second or whatever, however they define their performance criteria. So you should map out some, make some rudimentary mapping of your, your market space to say, where are you targeting if you've got co uh, competition in the area? Um, that's it. Any questions? I think I just have a quick comment uh, on the segmentation part. Uh, often you see another analogy used, uh, the pins on a bowling alley. If you imagine your whole market is essentially the pin standing at the end of the bowling alley, uh, the strategy you should adopt is you, know, you hit the first pin and you make that hit the next pin and, and henceforth, and eventually you have the whole market covered. But the idea then is to say, okay, what is going to be my first pin, our first pin for, for our product? It's the place where you have the simplest product and the largest possible market. And it's the place where you can the most, well, the earliest, uh, sorry, as early as possible and as easily as possible access the market and penetrate it. So when you have that pin covered and you have that market uh, filled with your products, then you go on to see, okay, let's look at the next pin we should hit. Could we do some, thinking of the platform uh, considerations as well, uh, could we do some small customizations of the current product to hit another market, another segment? And then you go forward, each time only taking you know, one step uh, to increase the complexity of the product instead of trying to hit all the pins at once, because that's never going to work. Mm. So that's uh, another analogy of, uh, of segmentation for the market. Mm. Uh, so that's a, a very nice analogy to say, of your product variance, which is your central pin, which one are you going to target first, which is your first customer. Um, just one very last point regarding the uh, integrated product development as a whole. This is a, a really nice slide, which I think sums up the worth of the product designer when you look at integrated product development. And although some of your design work at the beginning uh, only accounts for maybe 5% of the overall cost of a product's development, probably less. Um, the influence you have during this development phase, design phase outweighs all the other disciplines. Um, I think this is a really nice uh, diagram to uh, emphasize how important your task is at the beginning of product development. I'll be seeing you on uh, Friday. I think we'll do the usual uh, thing where, well, it will go into the usual thing where you'll have one minute presentation for each group where this time I'd like you to just say what your needs or challenges are. Perhaps, does anybody know somebody who can do some injection molding or rapid prototyping? Does anybody know anybody who works in this area? Does anybody know somebody who can sew, for example? Just ask these things out to the group. Uh, let's work some, get some networking going and be collaborative in this. Um, and also next week, just to let you know, we have some uh, guys from CBS coming over to talk about creativity techniques. Um, and we'd like to run it as a, uh, both introducing you to some creativity theory and techniques and methods, but also run it as a slight design experiment. Uh, so we'd like to be collecting some of the ideas you're producing next week. So it'd be really nice if we could have a, a decent turnout as we have today. Um, I'll see you on Friday.